this will present for us. So, um, oh no, that's the wrong one. Sorry, I'll let you find it. Okay, you, know where, you might know where it is. Um, I'll just give you a five minute when it's at the fifteen minute. Okay, if that's cool. I timed it this morning because I was trying to stick to fifteen, so I should be fine. I think if you just, I think you should be okay. You don't have to use that. I don't have to. I think. Okay. Sweet. I do tend to storm around a bit. I'll just try and stay still. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm uh, Ben Matthews. I don't identify as a sociologist. Uh, I'm a, actually a creative. Um, I work with a team, including Steve Threadgold, Adriana Harrow, who can't be here today. She's presenting at another conference, Julia Coffey, Josh Healy. And Julia Cook, uh, toward creating this publication, hustling toward the projectariat financialization, precarious creative industries futures. The picture you can see on screen is actually a co-working space, believe it or not. It looks like a concrete sarcophagus and it feels like one when you're in it. It's actually a hollowed out tire warehouse. In the foreground, you can see a table sitting on top of what is a massive hole in the floor, which is covered up with just some thin plywood, below which is a several meter drop, probably, probably to at least a broken spine and maybe your death. Um, so the owners of this just bunged in a bit of a um, dodgy kitchen and some toilets and set it up. And yeah, 10 years ago today, I was in there running my, my creative consultancy business. And as a part of that process, I met this really rich community of creatives. I was next to uh, an architect, an artist, a jewelry maker, two creative agencies, all jammed into that space. You could see down the far end of this um, warehouse and there's a dolly overhead on a um, railway line that we literally used as a flying fox. Um, and on the roof, we had massive parties and obviously everything was to code and perfectly legal, absolutely not. But um, we had a lot of fun and that inspired my research into precarity and creative labor because the ambivalences of that experience was something that I guess really shaped my sense of um, what it's like to work in the creative industries. And when I came back to academia, it became something I looked into. So the context for the current paper is actually includes this idea of commoning in the creative industries where new forms of organization based around commoning have emerged as a way to cope with the volatility of the creative industries. Young people as entrepreneurs, young people are impelled to be entrepreneurs of the self, to see the self as an enterprise. Wageless life and the projectariat, the projectariat moves from one project to the next to make a living engaging in short-term employment and high turnaround jobs. And incidentally, I actually teach creative entrepreneurship courses. That's my job at this university. And after I leave this meeting here today, um, I go to a, a meeting at the university with the research commercialization team because I'm spinning out a company and we're in negotiation with the uni around spinning that IP out in, into that startup company. So I'm definitely immersed in that ambivalence personally. Um, so creativity is often deployed in a manner that blurs lines between production and consumption, work and leisure, art and economy, all of which are evident in co-working environments such as that seen above where the workers spent long hours, recreated, shared resources and froze in the winter, cooked in the summer in a decrepit warehouse with a literal hole in the floor. So here we see unfolding the conditions of what Denning called a wageless life, where individuals or groups are engaged in work or productive activities without the security and regularity of wage-based employment. In the context of the creative industries and the projectariat, it embodies the shift from stable, long-term jobs to precarious freelance and gig work where income is irregular and insecure. And this term captures the experience of workers who must continuously hustle for short-term projects and gigs, often without the benefits and, and protections associated with traditional employment. So we might think of this as an ambivalent set of circumstances and experiences where apparent autonomy in fact enables the extraction of value from contractors and employees who must provide their own infrastructure and take personal financial responsibility for the process. A wageless life um, need not be seen as exclusively ex exploitative but can be a harbinger of the development of an alternative economy. Non-wage forms of economic exchange are largely the norm in the global south where wageless modes of work are a crucial, crucial means of survival and livelihood sustenance in conditions of financial hardship. Rather than reify wage labour, scholars in this field advocate for thinking about wageless life in the projectariat, not as 
exploitation, which it undoubtedly is, but as an opportunity to experience alternate, more just, sustainable and collaborative forms of exchange. Alakovska points to two distinct means of getting by for creative laborers. Consumption work, which involves performing lifestyle changes such as thrift, downshifting and self-provisioning, and alternative economic exchanges such as bartering, involvement in self-help communities and commoning practices. However, in the research here, we demonstrate strategies of young creative laborers who are oriented more strongly toward getting by and hustling. In effect, reinforcing existing normative preconceptions about insecure work rather than resisting or organizing against these conditions. But we discover young people through the research not as cultural dupes, but as realistic. We take up the notion of the guerrilla self to describe this. Here an attempt is made not to replace the existing system, but to play by the rules. It embodies a strategic adaptive approach to navigating precarious work environments, especially within the creative industries. So onto our methods now, which included semi-structured in-depth interviews, uh, sandboxing conducted by Adriana, who's not here today, using figures to elicit scenes that could later be discussed. And the study included 13, 18 to 30 year olds based in the Hutter, working in or training toward working in the creative industries. So the discussion areas included feelings or attitudes toward debt, including debt and parental support, engaging in precarious labor and investing in training and qualification, particularly where HEX or HELP was involved. So the themes that emerged from the research, we grouped under um, these four general areas, experiencing the projectariat, debt and the future, studying into the unknown, consumption work and lifestyle discipline and alter alternative economic exchanges. And I'll just go through and, and show you what some of the participants said in relation to each of these themes and how we sort of develop those through. So um, within experiencing the project Terriot, we had sort of three sub themes. And here we focus on the strategies young creatives use to manage work and financial instability, such as working for free and a quote here from Chloe. If you don't have any clients, it's about having a portfolio. So you just make up jobs or you do things for free or you do things for friends and you do it at a lower rate a lot of the time if you're getting paid at all. Side hustles and multiple jobs. Here we highlight the constant need to adapt and hustle to survive in the creative industries. A quote from Alex, because I am self-employed, income is not always consistent. And yet you could say that I'm essentially running two businesses with organizing regular LGBTI entertainment and parties, which is mainly a side gig, really. I could pay my rent through LGBTI project, which is good. And I also do other odd contract jobs. I manage local arts festival this year, so I may be doing that again next year. So you could say that I'm mainly just a contractor doing a bunch of different stuff to survive. I sell, I sell some art to sometimes. Yeah, you could say that again, a bunch of, of different stuff. So, um, and finally, continuous skill expansion involves trying to establish themselves as flexible entrepreneurial subjects through continuous skill expansion. And here's a quote from Tina who said, I want to get into the game design industry, but a lot of the reason I'm doing this PhD is to have teaching as an opportunity as well. I want to be able to get into as many good positions as I can. If I can't get a job in, the game, in game design, I can still teach until an opportunity comes up. I'm learning coding because that is used in like a lot of websites as well. And I'll be able to do that if I can't find work at something else. So it's just opening up as many avenues as I can. Within debt and the future studying into the unknown, we discovered sort of four sub themes, the first of which is um, gambling with education, uh, where students express their experience of bad faith around debt. Hex is meant to, uh, as Henry said, Hex is meant to be an investment, but it depends. I haven't seen too many dividends from it. I don't look at the debt too often. That's something I think they should do at the uni. Maybe have a figure on the courses that you're taking that might factor it in for some people. Like if it was on there more prominently displayed, then it possibly is on the course handbook website or whatever. It might factor into what courses I was taking. Ongoing costs, um, particularly highlighted through such things as software subscriptions, a common feature of um, the creative industries. 
as Tina said, there's a lot more ongoing costs like programs have that monthly payment that you need to make. So you can't go long periods without work because you always got to pay for stuff. And that kind of like harms you career wise when you're trying to build it up. Feelings of disempowerment about debt were common. And it definitely makes, uh, Lauren said, it definitely makes me really nervous because I know it's something that is very much out of your control. And finally, career uncertainty was a feature of investing in education, as we see here in Sam's sandboxing, which he described this way. Because at the moment, I've been trying to roadmap these pathways and learn and learning pathways and all that kind of stuff, but then also figure out how they could interact with each other. So we've got the little blue, the little aliens, blue figures, greeting me at the entry, um, at the entryway of the choice, because it's all very alien territory to me. So it's all very kind of not really sure. So consumption work, which involves managing the trajectory of buying, using and disposing of things in cheaper, more sustainable ways, um, was the next theme Lauren said here. I try to be a little bit resourceful. I don't go buy stuff new, look in some op shops and stuff and try to reduce that way. Uh, and in relation to lifestyle, discipline, frugality, and thrift, we've got a couple of quotes here. Sam said, I miss lunch one day or something like that. But like, that's something you can easily cut out. <laughs> you know, having two meals a day instead of three. Yeah, I've done it. And Gloria said, I don't go out clubbing or anything like that. I just can't afford it. I mean, I occasionally go out if it's my birthday or someone's birthday. I think that's okay. I think there should be definitely be a balance, but no, I try to just take food wherever I go so I don't get hungry and get takeaway and I catch the bus. And finally, choosing positive po poverty where a sentiment of acceptance was expressed. I'd be content if I was making enough money to live on, but I'm quite happy if things do scale up. But yeah, I don't have any specific kind of milestones in mind for that at the moment. The final theme was alternative economic exchanges where students engaged in commenting and took advantage of accessing software and platforms for free through their university. And shared ways of keeping access to these after they finished their programs, uh, impacting their careers. Chloe said, I think I'd probably go to my classmates first because I found that even if it's not a group assessment, like I have a friend who's just got a tripod and I have a gimbal. So we'll go out and film together and take our equipment and kind of swap and share. A common feature of this, obviously, was sharing and exchanging, and not just for the work itself directly. As Sam said, I've got a bunch of friends that do all kinds of stuff. I've been lucky to be able to source most of the things that I, I've needed because of that. Sometimes it's been a trade-off. Can I borrow this? Or can you do this for me? And I'll do this for you kind of thing. Collaborative networks, building a support network where others talked about approaching their friends with different skills for favors on paid projects. Sam said, I've got a friend who's a graphic designer and she did a logo for me and I made something for her that she wanted. So, you know, you do a bit of a trade like that. Henry's car broke down, but he got it fixed using a buy now, pay later service, feeling that he had to, because as he said, I'm the only one in the household that drives. So, I have to drive them. It's important to maintain my car. So summing up, participants in this study display characteristics of wageless workers in the project area, resonating with the concept of the gorilla self by adapting and navigating precarious conditions without directly challenging the entrenched norms and inequalities of creative industries labor. They engage in consumption work, commenting and alternate economic exchanges practices that highlight their struggles and strategies for entering and surviving in the creative labor market. The study also reveals diverse engagements among participants. Some are working in the creative industries while maintaining side hustles and others are pursuing degrees in creative industries or higher education to gain diverse skills and establish themselves as flexible entrepreneurial subjects. To navigate their precarious situations, participants rely heavily on available resources, such as parental support and credit debt. This generational shift has brought about significant doubt and guilt regarding the value of university education 
and the accumulation of hex loans, which are increasingly seen as gambles rather than as secure investments. Ultimately, commenting practices are leveraged not to resist precarious conditions of the creative industries, but to get by and find a semblance of stability within the current system in education and beyond. The future for young creatives is shaped by their financial subjectivities, support networks and creative aspirations. They often exhibit reflexively complicit attitudes toward precarity, accepting unstable conditions as part of their career landscape. This acceptance is intertwined with the concept of cruel optimism, where the pursuit of desired creative careers may ironically impede their overall well-being and flourishing due to the limited choices and persistent instability inherent in their professional environments. Uh, thank you, that's the end. No, it was like exactly 15 minutes. <laughs>